schools that would call to the museum and we would you know we would sign them up on a certain day and, and the ones in indiana <laughs> because there's certain places in indiana that, that change and some that don't mm -hmm. and it would be it was so complicated i said well what time is it there right <laughs> i mean it was it was so good morning to good morning so I have hard copies available, but everything will be on the screen as well. Hi, yeah. I'm turning it over to Vicar here in a little bit. <laughs> Take off your sunglasses, Mike. Who's this? Or if you guys want, just. Brett, if you want the back table, just take no, it. Fine. So while we're waiting here, I see someone from that. Here. So we had a synodical council for the Synod Met on Friday, all day Friday and Saturday morning. And the, the synodical council is the group that um, allocates funding for ministry. So we've known, the members of the Senate Council have known for months that we were literally going to have a few million dollars to allocate for ministry. And the hard part is doing that wisely. So it turns out, it, it, uh, and then, um, believe it or not, uh, Friday at 4.30 p.m., uh, the Synod was informed by the uh, Small Business Administration that its PPP loan had been forgiven almost fully. So that was uh, $2.8 million. Um, so we had more than $3 million in order to allocate for ministry. And how do you do that wisely? You don't want to do things that are, uh, you know, might not be you know, sustainable uh, monetarily in the future. Um, given the fact that the, Senate, that the Senate and Convention in July approved a plan by Board for Home Missions to establish 100 new home missions in 10 years, uh, beginning in 2023. So that plan was approved. Uh, the Synodical Council voted yesterday to allocate $3 million. They need $5 million to, um, uh, for this program to allocate those $3 million to home missions. So while our, our synod is slowly shrinking in numbers, just, this is one way to address it. But uh, more than anything, what our country needs is the gospel. And uh, if, we can, if we can establish 100 new missions over the next 10 years using these funds, uh, I think that'd be a wonderful thing. So pray for God to bless that. It was really amazing to watch that take place. Uh, you know, there, there could have been a lot of uh, heated debate on how to do this. It was very orderly, very brotherly, and it was a great thing to watch happen. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate in that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Vicar now. If you want a hard copy, there are several on the table, but you won't need them if you just want to read it from the screen, because I will do the scrolling through the screen as Vicar does. That. But you will need a hard copy for the opening devotion. I forgot about that. So share that opening worship. Vicar, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Pastor. Uh, we're starting a new Bible study today. Uh, I'm not sure how long it runs, but uh, this is Here We Stand, which is uh, our students' video slash uh, Bible passage discussion on uh, what makes us Lutherans uh, our heritage and um, the importance of holding to the truth and purity of Scripture. Uh, so for this first lesson, we've got like a 12 minute video, it looks like, um, which we'll watch after our opening devotion and prayer. And then we'll jump into some discussion on uh, different passages uh, and the importance of scripture. Uh, so we'll begin with reading responsibly, Psalm 32. I'll read the parts that are not bolded, uh, and I'll invite you to read the parts that are bolded. So... Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. And in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And, and did, did not, not cover up my iniquity. iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And there you forgave the guilt of my sins. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while they may be found. 
Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. And surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. We pray. Lord, I confess that I am by nature sinful and unclean. Yet you have cleansed me freely with the blood of Jesus and declared me to be righteous in your sight. Help me, Lord, to rejoice in your forgiveness so that I live a confident and joyous life in Christ my Savior. Amen. Amen. So again, uh, this is the start of our first lesson of the Here We Stand. Um, and just to introduce it a little bit, a little bit of backstory. Um, Martin Luther uh, was caught in a lightning storm and feared that he would die, like earlier on in his life. He knew that if he did die, he couldn't stand before God's holy judgment. After the storm, he decided to become a monk so he could be acceptable to God. Uh, but no matter how much he did, he found that he was still unworthy and he was very fearful of God's punishment. You may have had the same feelings at some point in your life, or perhaps someone that you know may be fearful of God's judgment on them. We know that we cannot do enough good to stand before a holy God. Luther found that the answer was not in himself or what he did, but it was all in what God did for him. Uh, he sent his son, Jesus, to pay for all of our failures and sins and give us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Luther understood that this truth was central to our hope of salvation, and that needs to be the foundation upon which the church is built. Uh, this truth was worth risking his life to proclaim. So that's what we'll see in our video segment now. This is April 18, 1521 at the Diet of Borns, where Luther is standing before the powerful leaders of the Holy Roman Empire, who have the ability to declare him a heretic. And as a heretic, anyone could kill Luther on sight. <laughs> is over. The time to speak has come. Martin Luther is on trial for his life. He's written works that are highly controversial, inflaming the most powerful people in the world. If he retracts his statements, he will live. But if he refuses, everyone expects Martin Luther will be burned alive. I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. Unless I am convinced by scripture or clear reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Luther did not recant, sparking a shockwave that swept across the world. The impact of Luther's stand is widely recognized, but often forgotten is why. Why would Martin Luther risk his life for his opinions? The answer is that Luther didn't see his writings as opinions at all. He saw them as undeniable facts, truths that flowed directly from the Bible. He went back to the Bible to get what he needed for certainty. And he found that certainty in the scriptures. Luther stood on the scriptures, on the scriptures alone. And for us as Lutherans today, uh, that's still where we stand, recognizing that everything we believe, everything we teach is drawn from only one source, and that's from the word of God itself. Jesus. 
The key truth of the scriptures that Luther uncovered was triggered by his study of Romans, where Paul makes it clear that God's favor cannot be earned, even partially, by doing good deeds. Instead, Paul explains that righteousness is a gift given by God to those with faith in Jesus. Alone. The righteous person lives by faith alone. This is not a new theology. This is the scriptural theology. This is the theology of Christ. This is the theology of the apostles. This is the theology of the early church fathers that has been corrupted in time. His study of the scriptures emboldened Luther. He was not afraid to criticize the church's errors, making his case that the scriptures are the ultimate authority, not the church's hierarchy. <clears throat> I am being misunderstood by the people. So let me be clear in my own language. I simply assert that a simple layman armed with scripture is to be believed above a pope or a council without it. Luther amplified his voice through a series of widely disseminated printed works that detailed the church's move away from scriptural truth. Luther kept saying, what I'm trying to do is return this church to its scriptural foundations. Once he was brought to trial, Luther's accusers laid out an assortment of his writings and asked if he stood by what he'd written. Among the collection were three of Luther's books that were especially offensive to church leadership. The first book critiqued the Vatican's claims of ultimate authority. The second noted the Catholic Church's drift from the Bible's teachings on the sacraments. The third demonstrated from scripture that because salvation is guaranteed, believers are free to stop worrying about their fate and can instead focus on loving others. By the medieval era, the Catholic Church claimed that it alone had the authority to interpret scripture, and the church's reach extended into the broader culture as the Pope asserted power over emperors and kings, effectively controlling everything. So when a critic emerged, like Czech theologian Jan Hus, the Pope could declare him a heretic and rely on the government to carry out the death penalty. <laughs> A century later, Luther seemed headed toward the same fate after being excommunicated by the Pope in 1521 and condemned by the emperor in the Edict of Worms. Once Luther left Worms, it was legal for anyone to kill him, and even Luther himself assumed he would not live much longer. His central crime was rejecting the Pope's expanding authority. Luther was emboldened by scriptural evidence that church leaders did not have a superior position in God's eyes, that there is equality among believers. They were all equal. They were all the same because they all had access to the same truth, the same grace, the same blessings from God. That's really what the priesthood of believers is all about. It means that every Christian has the word of God, the means of grace, not only for himself, but also then has the responsibility and the privilege of proclaiming and sharing that word with others. Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection has accomplished everything. The universal priesthood of believers means everyone has a role and no one is above correction. Luther wanted lay people to be well-versed in scriptural truths so they could admonish pastors, priests, and even popes when necessary. He wanted that common German peasant to understand what God was saying in the, in, in the New Testament. Our synod emphasizes Christian education because of the heritage that we've uh, received from Luther. You know, one of the things that Luther very early in his work tried to do was to insist on a education of the lay people, both adults and children.
Luther was opposed to the church adding sacraments that were not mandated specifically in the scriptures, and he saw errors in the church's teaching on Holy Communion or the Mass. In the medieval church, the Mass had become a work that earned favor with God. Neither one of the sacraments are works that I do for God. They're totally gifts that God gives to me. Luther was especially angered by rote masses performed for the benefit of people who were not even present, or even the dead. Lay people would often pay for these masses to be done on their behalf. Luther saw the practice as unscriptural and corrupt. The gift of saving body and blood in the sacrament, that the direction of worship is one that comes from a gracious God to the sinner, rather than the sinner's offering to appease God. Perhaps most controversial of all was Luther's writing on Christian freedom. Luther reclaimed the biblical truth that salvation comes as a gift of God and not through our works. He began to understand that that righteousness was not something that he could give God but that God gave to him because of Jesus. This good news meant that Christians were no longer in bondage to appeasing God with good works and could instead be assured of their salvation and thus live a life dedicated to loving others. In the gospel, God gives me everything in life and in death and in life after death. I'm free to serve because I don't need anything. There's no reason for selfishness. Lutherans are certain of their eternal welfare because God says so. God says so in the scriptures. The more you read Luther, the more you begin to hear Luther say, look, you now are living a life in this world, on this earth. And God has given you a rich field in which to be a useful person to your neighbor. And so I want you to serve your neighbor as, as, as you, you are now free uh, to serve your neighbor. An example of the freedom to show love to one's neighbor came in 1527 when the plague arrived in Wittenberg. Many fled the city, but Luther and his wife, Katie, secure in their salvation, stayed to help others in need. Luther recognized that when your eternal fate is assured, you can worry less about yourself and instead focus on others. And then the motivation for that freedom is that Christ loves me, he's forgiven me, now I can serve. Luther's publications did not contain radical new ideas, Rather, they were based on the ancient truths of Scripture. But these biblical doctrines were not being taught by the church of his day. The essential difference is that God gives us righteousness because of Christ. We don't give God righteousness in order to earn heaven. And that is the essential difference. Expose my errors. Overthrow them by the writings of the prophets and the evangelists. If I am shown my errors, I will be the first to throw my books on the fire. Famously, Martin Luther did not back down and was able to escape execution in the spring of 1521. He would spend the rest of his life under threat of death, but Luther didn't live in fear. Instead, he had been transformed here is the truly Christian life. Given a new life through an understanding of the truths of scripture, Luther's transformation would reshape the church, the culture, and the whole world. And it still shapes us today. Go ahead, Vicar, I'll get the uh, lesson up on the screen. All right. Um, so, continuing then with our, our study guide, uh, the first 
point that we're going to talk about is that we cannot achieve enough to win God's approval. We know that. Uh, that's what Luther's whole stance was about. It's it's we can't do enough good things to earn God's approval, uh, no matter how hard we try. Uh, and that's contrary to what our sinful natures believe. Uh, the sinful man wants to think that he can do something for his salvation. Uh, but as we see from scripture, God makes it absolutely clear that that's not possible. Um, we're going to read Romans 3, 9 to 18. And it very pointedly reminds us why we're unable to stand before God's holy judgment. Uh, I'll read the passage. And while I'm doing that, I want you to think of a list of sins that you see in our world that reflects the truth that's taught in this passage. Uh, and then we'll talk about that list afterwards. So what then shall we conclude? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So from that passage in the section of Romans where Paul was talking to them, uh, where he said, like, do we have any advantage over anyone else? By no means. Like, we're all alike under the, the law. Uh, we're all sinful people. Um, what are some examples from our world today where, where you see people um, in our world reflecting that truth taught in the, the, the bottom part? Like, we've all have turned away. Um, and then how they react to that, they become worthless, no one who does good, uh, specifically looking at like verses 13 and on towards the end. Can you think of any examples that you see in our lives today of, of this being true? Well, it's in all other religions other than Christianity. They're all based on works righteousness. Right. Yeah. Something else I Unless I'm missing something there, it was pretty easy question. Well, that's good. I'm glad that it was. Um, <laughs> the uh, all other religions in the world teach works righteousness, and that's kind of a crazy thought to think about. That Christianity is the one religion where you say, "I do nothing for my salvation. Jesus has done everything for me. His perfect life, His death, His resurrection. That's all done for me because of what He's done." I now have heaven. All other religions in the world say, here's what you need to do, uh, whether it's live a good life or do this many good deeds. Uh, there's always something that you have to do for your salvation. I find it interesting how that's creeping into Christian thinking, though. There, that I mean, people are thinking, I have to do something to earn my salvation. I have to have enough faith or I have to, um, you know, and, and um, something you have to make a decision or you you know all of that i think it's funny how it has to creep in where it's creeping in we have to constantly check it yeah and i mean at the point that you make with it constantly creeping in we saw that back in luther's day and age too like it had creeped into the catholic church uh it was indulgences it mm -hmm. was you need to say this many Hail marys uh all these things that you need to do to either get out of purgatory or um, escape the wrath of God. So like you said, that's something that we have to constantly check mm -hmm. because living as sinful people, we're always going to have that sinner saint fight in us that says, I know that I'm saved by grace alone, but I really want to do something for my salvation. Like mm -hmm. it can't be that easy. Right? You know, it's so easy to bash the other religions, but you're right. You got to think about Christianity and being hypocrites about it ourselves. Right, right. And and not just on a like a whole level, but on an individual level as well. Um need to look at my own heart. Um but then that's a wonderful blessing that we have as the community of believers here 
uh, at resurrection uh, that we have as Lutherans in the world, it's like we're holding each other accountable. Um, we're, we're here together to strengthen faith and we, we worship on Sundays or Saturdays or whenever we get to come together to hear again God's full and free forgiveness of sins and what he's done for us. Like that's, that's where we get to hear. Pastor, to that? I thought of the, when he said their, their, uh, their tongues practice the sea. In our world, you can't count on anything that is said or written absolutely being true. People will construct the, the narrative to fit their need. It's awful. Or the bitterness, he talks about their mouths are full of bitterness. You know, the bitterness people speak, it's, it's awful in our world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, interesting that you say that. I, uh, later today, I'm uh, traveling back to teach uh, confirmation class to one of our members who's going through it. And we're learning about the Holy Spirit in the Christian church. And one of the, the study guide questions that we have here is like, why is it so important that we have a very clear definition of what truth is? Um, we know what truth is from God's word, but as pastor said, our world around us, truth is subjective. It's not objective. It's, it's whatever you want it to be. Uh, your truth is different from my truth. I think that's something that we hear a lot. Uh, and that makes it a struggle for us to witness because we know that we have the only truth. Uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to heaven except through him. But when the world around us thinks, well, that's true for you, but I'm going to keep believing what I believe. That's really hard. Uh, that's a lie that the devil, the world, and uh, our own sinful flesh wants to tell us. So that's something that we need to be aware of. More to this first question. Or should we move, move on? All right, I'm getting a couple minutes. Uh, it's easy to find examples of sin in our world today. But Paul wrote, there is no one who does good, not even one. Uh, that's in verse 12. Uh, no one? Really? Uh, why are you and I included on this list of condemnation? We still sin. Yeah, I can listen to this, and I agree full heart, wholeheartedly that the Bible doesn't give us a list of rules. It shows us how free we really are for what God has done for us. And that half hour later, I can be looking at someone saying, now, what are you going to do for me? How important are you? And, and I'm ashamed of that. But it, we're not... We're not um, it's not just an on or off. I mean, it's not a thing that once it's on, the switch always stays on and you're just doing that all the time. We still fight with our inner sin, our sinful being. Oops. Sorry, right. guys. No, no, no. That's, that's a really wonderful point. Knock that around. <laughs> you didn't, though. The, the Zoom class would have taken a tumble. <laughs> <laughs> it would have gone for a ride. I think, I think Satan uh, is very alive and in this world. and He pushes those buttons that knows, you know, we each have our own buttons, if you will, that would lead us to sin, lead us to into temptation, lead us to doubt what God really has said. And so we are definitely not free from anything in this world, um, unfortunately. And so it's that constantly checking um, yourself to make sure that you're with God. And then when you're not, you go, sorry, Lord, I, I sinned. And it's our simple nature. And thankfully he has unlimited forgiveness. Yeah, that was really well said. I, I think it's important for us to remember that the devil's been doing this since the beginning. Uh, the father of lies, like that question, did God mm-hmm. really, really say? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's not just in uh, relation to, did God say, don't eat this fruit? It's, he uses that for you and me every day. Did God really say I shouldn't road rage after the guy cuts me off on the freeway at home? Uh, whatever it may be. Um, but then, like you said as well, we, we say, like, this is where I've departed from God. Like, Lord, I'm sorry, I've sinned. Um, and we know where that departure comes from when we're standing on the word of God. Like, that's that's our, our guide. Right? That's, that's where we see that. And then, like you said, full and free forgiveness. Like, that's unlimited grace that God has. Um, so that's a wonderful blessing. Um We'll look at Isaiah 64, verse 6. Uh, how does this passage help you understand the terror and despair that Luther felt about God's attitude towards the sinner? Uh, so if, if you just had this passage, um, how would that make you feel? Uh, we'll read it. 
All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and the wind our sins sweeps us away. That's all you had of God's word. How'd that make you feel? Almost you say, why bother us? Right? No hope also. Right. There's nothing. Even our righteous acts are filthy rags. If 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 that's it, what hope do I have for eternal life? Um there is no hope then. Like even the good things that I think I'm doing, like God says that's not enough. Um and so those are the good things. I know the, the bad things that I do too. And if I have both of those things going on and both of them are <laughs> equally damning, equally condemning, uh, like you said, there is no hope. That just makes us feel hopeless because um, we're unclean. All we deserve from God is judgment. Um, that's actually leading into the question four. I kind of combined the two questions there. Um, if that were all you knew of God, would you feel the same? I think we talked about that, like that terror and despair that he had. Uh, if that's all we knew of, of God, I think that's safe to say that's how we would feel too. Um, if all I knew of God was that he's going to be watching for me whenever I slip up and then that's it, we're done. Um, all I know of him is that he is going to judge me for the wrongs that I've done and the good that I have not done. Um that leave me hopeless and terrified. So, switching from that sad outlook on what we know of God, uh, what can we do? Uh, this is really important for us to uh, put it into practice. Uh, many people today have their own ideas about how to answer that question. Like when they think of facing a righteous God, uh, what solutions do many people offer? Like, so in our world today, like, if all they think of is facing that righteous God, uh, when they stand before Peter at the pearly gates, or whatever they may say, what, what, uh, what have you heard uh, in your interactions, if you've ever had a conversation like that? Right? It's like, if uh, you died today, where would you be? Uh, heaven or hell? I think a lot of times people um, try and rank themselves against other people so they're going to say well i'm not as bad as that person over there mm -hmm. and you know so then they, or, or look at all the good things i have done you know and they're these are going to like a scale we're going to outweigh mm -hmm. um the good and the bad or i've done mostly good in my life or i haven't i've never but, murdered anybody yes yeah. they're playing the, the comparison yeah. game yeah or, or he's a good person He's such uh -huh. a good person. Surely don't be in heaven. Right. Look at all the good things that he did for his community. Mm -hmm. Like he was charitable. He donated a lot. What do we know from God's word that would combat that approach of uh, comparison or um, self-evaluation of I'm generally a good person? Because I think most people would say that they are. Like I don't. I don't think unless there's someone who's really eaten away by like the guilt of the things they've done. I don't know if like right at the surface, they would say, yeah, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> um, they probably say I'm, I'm a pretty good person. Like I try, um, you know, I, I know I don't do everything good, but for the most part, I'm a good person. What, uh, what do we know from God's word that really just cuts that argument out right from underneath us? Well, that we all sin, and the least of the sin is, is the same as the worst of the sin. Right. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We just read that in Romans. Um, yeah. Or any act that you do without faith is a sin. Right. That's what that's what we're talking about here, too. Like uh, James talks about uh, faith and works being tied um, together. Uh, if you do works apart from faith, what are they? They're, they're dirty rags. Mm -hmm. um, faith with works, that's true um that works upon you differently um so again like we see how people try and wheel out from underneath god's judgment uh, but if we really drive down to it uh like even the people that at the surface would say i'm generally a good person 
if we kept on talking with that person, or even if it's like ourselves trying to convince ourselves, I'm a pretty good person. Deep down, I know. I know the things that I think about. I know the things that I say. I know the things that I do. Um, and if the standard for God is perfection, you know, he says, be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. If that's the standard, and I can't sin even once. It's, that's why I, it, it's so, this religion is so logical. Mm -hmm. a logical person mm -hmm. so how can you have peace if you are constantly wondering about hey have i done enough to get to heaven mm -hmm. how could you be at peace i don't think yourself? you are and it, that's how i think i i think you raise up a good point um with other religions if it's works based in the back of your mind if you're sitting on your deathbed or, or even like laying awake at night wondering like okay have i done enough have I done enough to outweigh the good and the bad? Like, is have I done enough to tip the scales? And I don't think you do. The joy and the comfort that we have as Christians, again, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. And that's the peace that I have done all things for you. Uh, there's nothing that you have to do. I've given you everything freely as a gift. Um, because once you do something in like to receive something, it's no longer a gift. You know, like if, if any part of our salvation was based on what we've done, um, then it's not a gift anymore. It's something that we've earned. But as we know, we haven't earned our salvation. That's something that God has given us freely. I think a lot of uh, people just don't want to think about it. And I think in a lot of Christian religions or churches, they don't hear the message. So that's why a lot of people think there's nothing to learn really. Mm -hmm. about maybe their church people do and other religions so maybe they want to be spiritual but not religious so they focus on just the big things about themselves and that's what they that's their spiritual life yeah yeah i think that's really important to keep in mind too um that it isn't our focus here today isn't just uh, i want you to come away from, away from this saying like we're really good at this and everyone else is really bad <laughs> that that comes back to all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Like the people who don't know what Jesus has done for them, those are the people that we're witnessing to. That that we want to share Jesus' love with because they may think to themselves, "I have to do something. I haven't done enough. I don't have peace, or I, I I'm not hearing something different in this congregation uh, because it's still what I do." Um, and so I don't want to be a part of this congregation if all I'm hearing is like, if you pray harder, if you do more good works, then God will bless you in your life. And if you if your life isn't full of prosperity and riches, then, well, you're not a good enough Christian or believer. Um, we need to hear God's word, the, the truth and purity of scripture. Um, and that's what that's what our focus on is here. It's it's not. Um, Thank you, Lord, that that we're so good. It's, it's thank you, Lord, that you've been so good to us, um, that you have given us the gospel and its truth and purity, that uh, you've been faithful to us. Um, and now we get to share your word with other people. Um, continuing on with Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 19 and 20, look at some of the flaws in the natural human response to the question. We may have covered some of these already, so this could be a quicker question. Um, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. So we've talked a lot about those responses that people have. Um, what is Paul saying here? If uh, we're looking at the law as something that I can do to earn my salvation, what is his response here to that? We've kind of been talking about that. What we're supposed to do is notice that as we look at all those law things, we can't, we're supposed to realize we can't do it, and now I really need, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the, the purpose of the law is to show us how impossible it is our own right right like uh the old catechism um split between what law and gospel does it you know it shows us our sin 
then it shows us our need for our Savior in that as well. And the gospel shows us our Savior and what he's done for us. Um, yeah, if, if everyone is held accountable under the law, um, so God's law, these are the things uh, that you need to do, be perfect and holy. All of us are held accountable under that. Um, and there's no one who has held that completely, perfectly, except one. And that was Jesus Christ. He did that for us in our place, um, lived his perfect life for us. Um, this next section, Pastor, we got like five minutes left. Do you want to keep going? Sure. Okay. Going. All right. Um, God gives us the gift of righteousness freely through faith. And we've been talking about that all Bible study, which is a really good thing to be talking about. Um, the question seven says the despair that was evident in Luther's life initially was the result of misunderstanding the law and gospel. We see that in our world today too, uh, the despair that some people have or the self, uh, confidence and misappropriated faith, um, Ultimately, that is the end result of all human answers to the question, what can we do? Uh, ultimately, it's always despair. Um, reading Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4, think about this question. How does this passage dispel that despair? Um, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. How does this passage dispel that despair of thinking, what can't we do? Because it shows us that Jesus forgives us. There's not a book with all the lists and the marks against us. You know, where he looks at us and he doesn't see this record of, you know, wrong and sin and everything we've done that's been against his word. It's all just clean and free. And because of that, we can then serve him without feeling guilty that I'm serving, I'm praising, I'm, I'm giving all my love to the Lord, and there's this list of black marks behind my name, you know? So that's that's wiped away, that's clear. We can serve them freely. No guilt in life, no fear in death. Um, what we have here, uh, I had to chuckle, like, reading through this. Um, actually, a lot of these passages um, coincide with what uh, I get to talk about in our sermon today. Uh, but then also our children's message, uh, what you talked about with like that messiness of sin um, is actually something that we're going to be talking about as well with the, with the kids. Um, God does not see the messiness anymore when he looks at us. He sees Jesus' perfection, his righteousness. Um, we've been washed in the blood of Jesus. Um, we made clean. So when God looks at us now, it's, it's not a record of the things we haven't done. It's all Jesus. Um, that's an incredible comfort because as you said now we're free to serve um, as the video said too like we're free there's nothing holding us back anymore there's there's no jealousy there's no selfishness of things that I need to do it's God you've done all things for me and now I get to live for you uh, I get to serve you with my whole life uh, having the right answer to the question is the key to our salvation uh, Romans 3 21 to 25 gives us that answer. Uh, God spells out his solution for sinners. Uh, so we're going to talk about what that solution is. And we know that the, the base answer is Jesus. Um, spoilers. Um, spoilers. Sunday school answer. Um, Jesus, God, or sin. Yep. Always three answers. The trifecta. Yep, yep. Uh, but what we're going to look at is how this passage specifically talks about that. And then talk about how that's different from other human solutions. So, but now apart from the law of righteousness, God is made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So how is this different from human solutions? What Paul just said in this five verses of 
Law and gospel. God fixed our problem. Yeah. We we don't have to fix the problem because God did. Mm -hmm. Of not of being separated from him through sin. He did it. Yeah. He did all. God said, This is the problem that you have. I'm gonna take care of it for you. And he did. Uh, he sent Jesus. Like I think it's really important for us to remember that um the fall into sin. God knew that before that that would happen. It wasn't a whoops, this happened. Now I need to scramble quick to come up with a way to to, to fix this. Before He even created the world, God knew this is what mankind would do to fall into sin, and He still created the world because He loved us so much and wanted to show us His love for us, saying, "You fell into sin, you messed up, but I have a solution." For that i'm going to send my son jesus this is how much i love you uh, he's going to live a perfect life for you in your place and he's going to die on the cross to take away your sins the, the wrongs that you've done and he's going to rise again all to assure you that i love you and i want you to live with me in heaven forever um that's the comfort that we have i think that might be a good place for us to stop our study mm -hmm. Not only because it's a good place to end, but also because it's 945. Um, we'll close with prayer, though. <laughs> Dear Lord, as we go through this study, uh, here we stand. Uh, remind us that we stand on grace in Christ and faith alone. Uh, we stand entirely on what you have done for us. It's not on the things that we've done or haven't done. It is by grace that we're saved through, through faith in Christ Jesus. And this is not of ourselves. It's, it's a gift from you uh, so that we can't boast, but also that we can rest in confidence and assurance that you have done all things for us because of your love for us. Uh, in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks for the discussion. Pastor, is there anything? Uh, we'll use the sheets next Sunday. So if you just want to leave in here, I'll cut them out in next week. <coughs> I'm going to give you a quick tour.